welcome back to episode six of our Chasing the Vision series in partnership with Violand and Exit Strategies. I'm excited to bring JT Cry and Tim Hull back into the conversation. Um, JT Cry is the founder of Exit Strategies, and Tim Hull is the general manager of Violand Management Associates. And this has been a really, really fun series to record so far. I know I'm not a restoration company owner, but I've learned a lot as a business owner listening to these two gentlemen and all of the insight that they have on running a business um, from many different angles. So in this episode, we are talking about financial cleanliness and what that looks like, what that means. Um, since JT and Tim come at this from kind of different angles, I'm going to toss it over to JT first to kind of define what you say or how you define financial cleanliness kind of on the m and transaction selling side of things. And then Tim is going to give his definition as well of what financial cleanliness looks like more from the consultant uh, working directly with restoration companies from that standpoint. So JT, take it away. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Good to be back with you as well, Tim. Appreciate it. This is going to be a really good podcast. I love the discussion around financial cleanliness because it means so many different things to different owners. Mm -hmm. From a very high level, financial, cl financial cleanliness is is the business what we said it was? And how well can a business owner interpret their own financials and find data? It's a big deal. And I work with several that, that can understand the basics of a P&L, but they don't really understand how to read it, let alone KPIs. That's a foreign concept to some. Tim, I know you'll agree with that, but, but it's a real thing. But when you think of paper trails for money coming in and out of the business, uh, the money coming in and out, is it legal? You know, is it something we can do? Are we tracking uh, job costing? You'd be surprised how many companies don't track that. Um, how about underbillings and overbillings and receivables? Uh, you know, right down to the basics of a, a big pool of accounts receivable. Well, how much is bad? How much is questionable? You know, we need to know these things, right, to help run our business and and some owners, they'll lick their finger and stick it in the wind and say, ah, it's about 20% is bad or 20% is questionable. There ought to be different metrics than that. So you, you can get down in the weeds on, you know, how to track Google AdWords and are they effective and how are your plumber referrals set up and what does it mean to pay them and is that a good return on investment? So ultimately, clean financials is having a business, for, this from my seat, having a business owner really understand their business from the chart of accounts and how it's set up and does it reflect business? And now can we regurgitate that information back to a potential buyer now or years down the road? And can we prove what's happening? It's one thing to say it's happening. Can we prove what's happening? And if we can do that, we've got a financially clean business. And then we can get down in the weeds of software that talks to each other and how to make that happen from guys in the field to people in the office. And that's really kind of Tim's department. But um, from a high level, that's what financial cleanliness means to me. Okay, Tim, what is your definition of financial cleanliness? What do you look for? It's it's pretty darn close. And, and even if you know, look at it, maybe in a little bit more granular detail, uh, it, it simply means that the, the books have to have integrity. And, and I mean, I think you articulated that well, JT. You know, the, the numbers, the financial statements and the things that you look at, that that's your scorecard. Um, you know, if you, if you think about it, it from that context, those are the ultimate measurements for for the performance of the organization. And they've got to have a degree of integrity to them for you to be able to make good decisions, mm -hmm. moving your business forward, but also from, you know, from an analysis standpoint. Um, so I, I look at it really from a freedom as a freedom from mistakes type of mm -hmm. state. If you look at it that way, it's got to be timely and it's got to be accurate. And if it meets those two criteria, then I know I've got some things that I've got to work with. But those are the first two things that need to be met. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the way the chart of accounts is set up, the, the way I have my expense or my revenue structure uh, established inside my accounting system, they don't mean anything if the numbers are garbage. So it's got to have yeah. some too. It's kind of like, you know, keeping score for, for anything that you do in this world. And I, I, I liken it to my golf game because I, I came home last week and I said, hey, you know, my, my son said, how'd you play? And I said, I was, I was four over. And he said, really, dad, that's pretty good for you. And I said, absolutely. And I came home with four more balls than I left with. <laughs> so he gets, he gets excited when, when I shoot under par too. But, it, but that just proves the point. You know, you've got to have some relativity to the information that you're looking at otherwise you can make some pretty big assumptions about mm -hmm. a business when they're not they're not valid 
Yeah. Okay. Agreed. Okay, so let's start really high level. And this is like a low hanging fruit type question. Tim, I'll toss this one to you first. What are some things immediately that are red flags to you when you look at company financials where it's like, yes, this is a properly accepted thing by the masses, but this really is not clean in your books. You really just shouldn't be running this through your books. You should yeah. be handling this somewhere else. Yeah, I've got a couple off the top of my head on that one, Michelle. And, and this is through personal experience and working with uh, contractors for the last 15 years, things that I see commonly happen. Um, the first one's running personal expenses through the books. I mean, you know, everybody does it to a certain degree and I hope nobody, you know, we don't have any IRS agents that are, that are listening to our, our show, <laughs> but you know, it's a pretty commonly accepted practice as long as it's justifiable, right? So mm -hmm. you've got a cell phone and everybody has a cell phone and the company's paying the bill. And, you know, you have those types of things that, that occur. I think when it gets out of hand is when, when business owners start to do that to a larger degree in lieu of taking W-2 compensation. Okay. So when they start saying, all right, I'm going to take the electric bills from my personal properties and run them through the business because it'll, no, it's not going to raise any flat red flags. You, you start to create a dependency there. And, and we can share a story later on in the episode about, you know, what that looks like at one extreme. But when you're using the company, bank account as your personal checkbook, um, things get a little bit wonky, right? The second one that I see commonly happen is the adjustment for work in progress on an accrual basis in an effort, in an effort to maintain the lending balance or the, the lending, um, uh, uh, the line of credit uh, covenants. Yep. Okay, so that, that borrowing base, oftentimes if it's large enough is based on the amount of receivables in a business. And when companies are cash strapped and they're up against the, the, the limits on the line, they will play with the accrual of the revenue in order to maintain that lending balance and not have it pulled, pulled off of them. That is a huge, huge mistake. And once you start digging that hole, uh, it seems like it never gets filled back mm -hmm. in. JT, mm. what about you? Any immediate red flags that you see when you're going through financials? Well, I'm sitting here smiling because... I know we typically wait for story time, but I have to tell one now if I can. I'm at a trade <laughs> yeah. show a few years ago. Um, a gentleman walks up and kind of gets in my personal space a little bit to be confidential. And he said, how do you handle building a house through your business? And I said, mm -hmm. you mean like you sent, you know, some, you know, tradesmen, some subs over to a rental. You put a roof on it, built a deck. He goes, no. I built a house and I said, you mean you created a job file and you built a whole house from the ground up? He said, yeah. And I said, um, hmm. can you prove it? He says to the penny. And I said, are we talking little house like a rental or your own house? He goes, no, $754,000. And he went right down to the penny. Nice. I've seen private educations. I've seen helicopters. I've seen motocross racing teams. You name it. I've seen it in business, right? Um, RVs can be modal, mobile offices. I mean, there's nothing that surprises me anymore. And to Tim's point, there is a certain level of addbacks and adjustments that are expected. And then there's those that are just sort of pushing the envelope. And you get to pushing the envelope. The danger is not that they're there or that they can't be proven. Is that if a lender or a buyer has to work too hard to prove them, they're just going to delete them. And so you may have every great intention of you can prove the RV payments or the storage and the insurance, but a lender may not go down the list that far. Mm -hmm. And so what I try to do to help make it clean is I use four different buckets of ad backs to help separate out what's personal and what isn't. There's EBITDA, business, personal, and the normalizations. And so we, we try to limit those personal ad backs to the six or eight that are pretty common, but you get into 15, 20, 25, it, it's a laundry list that's got to be cut back. Mm -hmm. The sad part about that scenario too, Michelle, that we see happen play out a lot, especially in smaller businesses, is that they're really robbing the the business. If you think of the business as being separate than, from them, they're mm -hmm. robbing the business of cash flow that could be used to reinvest in the organization and help grow. And uh, and, and that's I think a tragedy at the end of the day. Yes. Okay. And, and I do okay. think that over the last um, 10 years, the software accounting has come a long way. I think it's given operators more key metrics, uh, time sensitive information. I think 
operators in general have come a long way to help lean on some software and better coaching. And, you know, I think the whole industry has risen uh, the, the last uh, decade. So I think now today, especially, you know, you throw in a little coaching, there's no reason why business owners can't run a nice clean business with really timely, accurate information. It's, if you do it any other way, it's, there's a dose of laziness in there that they, they maybe don't, don't, they want to keep bearing a bunch of expenses. And, you know, that just works for some people. Tim, how does the need um, for people in a finance department shift as a company grows? You know, there's bookkeepers, there's staff accountants, there's controllers, there's CFOs, there's all these different kind of titles and interims that can be in here. So how does that shift based on where a company is revenue wise? What do they need as they grow? Yeah, I mean, there's no hard, fast rule. Like when you get mm -hmm. to two point four nine million dollars, and all of a sudden you get a, it doesn't work like yeah. that. So, but there are some general rules, you know, as as an organization grows. I think, um, unfortunately, in small business, sometimes we have a, a tendency to over title positions um, too quickly, you know. So, yeah, yeah, you get you meet somebody in JT. You've probably done this. You met somebody at a, a trade show or a conference. Say, hey, I'm the CFO of whatever. Oh yeah, great. And then you look at their annual revenue, and they're you know a million too. It's like mm -hmm. a CFO. <laughs> um, so titles are titles, right? But for the yeah. context of this conversation, Michelle, you know, when a business just starts off until it gets to about a million five, maybe two million dollars in that range somewhere, we typically see the office manager, bookkeeper, you know you know, jack of all trades kind of position, HR clerk, you know, they're, they're doing everything. They're wearing all those hats because they can. Um, and there's not really a high degree of financial wherewithal that's needed at that size to, to, to warrant, you know, separate or, or specialized type positions. When you start to get into that 2 million to maybe say $5 million range now, now we've needed, you know, you need somebody that's got some accounting knowledge um, because now the demands for, analyzing the results and looking at the numbers in a specific way to to judge performance are elevated. Um, so we typically see somebody with um, that can grow into that position, usually with a little bit of training, a little bit of education, and of course, some guidance from an outside CPA. And that's one thing that we really promote with our clients is not, don't just let us look at the numbers on a regular basis, but take the time to have a regularly scheduled meeting with your, with your accountant every single month, or at least every quarter and have them look at it from a tax perspective. So we look at it from a you know an operations perspective, they look at it from a tax perspective. When you start getting into the $5 million range and up, that's where we see the, the true need for a controller position or a staff mm -hmm. accountant, where you they don't need to be a CPA, but it would probably do you good if, you, if they had an accounting degree, um, because you're gonna get into start higher, getting into higher level discussions with your accountant, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they, they have to prepare the information to give to the CPA for the tax returns. They've got to, you know, do journal entries that aren't typical uh, in a standard bookkeeping role. But in that position, also, we we see the volume of journal entries increase. So more payables, more receivables, and really at that level, uh, that's kind of below their pay grade, if you will. So you need somebody else that can do that, punch out the data entry and the coding at a lower cost point than you would somebody that's a high priced, you know, uh, financial manager. When you start getting above that, that's where re you really get into, you know, director of finance and accounting, somebody that's got maybe a finance degree mm -hmm. or has a CPA, a CFO, you know, that type of role. And, and that's where they, they start getting into the operating capital discussions where, uh, it, do we spend cash on this capital asset? Do we borrow? what puts us in the best position at, in come tax time. There, there's a lot of financial discussions that go on there that are way beyond bookkeeping. So uh, hopefully that gives you the spectrum. It does. I'd, I'd love to add a comment yeah. to that in that not enough companies plan for that. You know, this industry is really great for go out and sell and then let your systems and procedures catch up. Those who are really successful, they plan for that growth and they build those systems and procedures as they grow. And I'm sure, Tim, and I can't tell you how many times we've seen a 10, 15, 20 million dollar company and the office bookkeeper or their spouse is still doing the books. And it's a disaster. It's just a disaster. And it's um, when I come along and say, we really need to make some changes here. And we've got to get the systems caught up with where you're actually at. There's there can be a little bit of fence taken, like somebody's not doing a good job. Well, they are with the understanding that they have. 
But Tim is correct. The uh, high level controller should be in these leadership and management meetings. So they're fundamental to this, the success of the business. And so if you plan a little bit and know where you're headed to stay ahead of that curve with the talent needed for that position, you'll be light years ahead. Yeah. Fundamentals are a great word, JT. Um, and yeah. you know, we have, we have hundreds and hundreds of different forms and processes and, and procedures and things that we've tools that we've developed to work with our clients over the years and got a whole library full of them. Um, the most commonly used one that I use from the accounting and finance library is mm -hmm. a simple cost approval process. Yeah. Almost every client that we work with uh, does not have one in place. It's very mm -hmm. fundamental in nature, but it eliminates so many mistakes and it ensures the integrity of that data that, that it's a huge fix. Initially, mm -hmm. off the giddy up, you, you give it to them and you go, oh, wow. You mean my bookkeeper doesn't have to guess what GL code to put on this thing. Mm -hmm. No, well, they should never guess. <laughs> you know, you should be approving it and telling them what cost code to put on it because mm -hmm. you're the only one that knows what that expense is for. Um, so if you're just leaving some, it pants, then, it, it, uh, it's exactly right. And some of these things just evolve. This industry is full of good people. And I just delivered a valuation on a business that essentially wasn't sellable because mm -hmm. it's um, the way he started his business 15 years ago as a carpet cleaner the the day that the project was done that was when the services were delivered well fast forward full service restoration company let's say it's um a three-month project you got a hundred thousand dollar project it's three months long every invoice that goes out even change orders was backdated to the first date of that project wow. so he started his business that way the cpa said great well now it lands in my lap and when you look at a trailing 12 and you look in the last couple of months, there's no income there. There's none because it all got backdated to two or three, four, five, six months ago. And eight, 10 months down the road, a change order would get backdated to that date. And it, the seller just started it that way. He didn't know any better. It worked for him until it came time to sell. The mistake was the CPA let it evolve 10 years as a full service company. So, you deliver news like that and you say, we got to completely rebuild your accounting system here before you're even sellable. And then we're going to have to let those numbers run for a year to prove out what's really happening. So there can be some pretty devastating news delivered if, if a company like that, and that's a rarity, but if it slips through the cracks to that level, it, it's a real discussion. Okay. So this is a little bit of a pause here to keep going on a conversation that we hadn't planned to talk about, but you both have talked about CPAs and that's an external person, usually not within the company, obviously. What are some um, qualities of a good CPA that restoration contractors specifically should be looking for as they kind of like vet their CPA, make sure that they're a good fit for their company? Because there's so many different types of companies out there. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in on that one. Um, so I think they, they need to be a, a trusted partner for one. Um, mm -hmm. So they're a professional services advisor, just like we are consultants, just like JT would be on the buy sell side of things. Um, th they need to be a, an advisor more. They, they need to, you know, mm -hmm. take care of their clients. Um, some will rely on family members, as you alluded to, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Others will go out and think they need, you know, KPMG or, you know, some of the big boys that are out there in the market. And I think it's all it all has to do with the size organization you are and level of complexity, but they need to be reachable and, you know, come between January and April. If you can't pick up the phone and call your accountant and get a hold of them, they're probably, you're probably not that important to them um, because that's their mm -hmm. busiest time of the year. And if they can't get to you at that point in time, now you're four months behind your, 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 uh, your counsel for the year. Um, so the, the, that in and of itself needs to be there. Um, I think they need to have enough staff um, that's capable of supporting your needs as well. So there are a lot of independents out there uh, that will work as a solo operator and they're just preparing taxes. But we we need more than just tax preparation. Mm -hmm. um, we need clarity. We need understanding. Uh, and better than that, we need advice. Um, and they know the tax laws. They know uh, best practices for accounting. And, um, and And I don't think, I think that should be the minimum you know, barrier of entry that you're looking for from a CPA. Okay. All right, JT, anything you want to add? Moving on? Yeah, yeah, I will. I'll add just a brief comment here. I'm going to echo everything Tim just said, but uh, CPA in my world has got to have a little bit of construction experience and understand the world uh, of, of restoration. 
you give me a restoration company doing $20 million and you line up 10 CPAs, we'll show you eight different ways they can do the books, you know, and none of them are wrong, but gap accounting is really hard to achieve. True gap is hard to achieve in this industry. And so it, it, everyone comes really close and occasionally it's hit, but it's hard and it's, it, it's full of intentional and purposeful steps. If you just sort of ad hoc, the accounting uh, process is never going to happen. And so it's got to be done with intention and purpose. So um, there, are, there are more and more CPAs that I'm coming across that have extensive uh, restoration experience. And if you're just recruiting CPAs from the outside and you, know, you think that someone's going to knock it out of the park in the restoration world without experience, they've got a long learning curve ahead of them. JT, you, you made a good comment there that I think is important to note to the audience too. And that's that most people don't really come to the standard of gap a hundred percent. I think for most of the companies that are probably listening to this, the gap standard to the T and to a hundred percent is probably unrealistic and unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. It it would probably cause you to incur costs that you really just can't afford. Yes. But shooting for that level of accuracy or at least uh, uh, integrity, again, back to that word of integrity, creating that type of integrity with your uh, company financials is is a worthy pursuit. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So moving from one acronym of GAP to another, let's talk about KPIs, key performance indicators. Tim, I'm going to toss this one right to you. And this could be another whole episode in and of itself. We keep hitting these topics in these episodes of like, well, this could be an hour all by itself, but a high level of KPIs in restoration. What does it look like? Um, what are some best practices? Yeah. So I'll give you the, I kind of give you the top, the hit list, right? The top um, most most commonly <laughs> asked for ones. Uh, we're starting evaluating a business's performance. You know, we look at a standard set of metrics on the income statement and the balance sheet that give us a very good indication of how healthy that business is, how efficient they are, how productivity, you know, what the productivity looks like, and then um, what their what their financial health, overall financial health is as an organization. So going down the the income statement, you know, again, that diversity of revenue stream that I'm looking for in the top, those benchmarks we discussed, greater than 20% mitigation, less than 50% for repair. That was in the last episode we discussed that. Um, and then um, allowing that to kind of guide what I expect to see from the rest of the income statement. Um, on the cost of goods sold section, uh, I'd like to see a well-defined cost of goods sold section. The highlight reel there is your direct labor your subcontract expense and your material expense. Those are the big three that make up the vast amount of your um, your cost of goods sold expenses. Um, depending on what your revenue stream is, depends on what those benchmarks from a percentage of revenue standpoint should be. But either way, it's going to lead me to a gross profit line that should be somewhere within the industry benchmarks for that. So if I'm doing mitigation work, I would and that's all I did. I would want to see, you know, a 65, 70% at the gross profit line. If I'm doing repair work, I want to be somewhere between 40 and 50. Um, if you're doing better than that, that's great. You know, if, if you're grossly uh, below those margins, then then we probably need to look into something. Um, again, mitigation repair heavy will depend on how much SGNA or sales general and administrative expenses, also known as overhead expenses, what that line looks like. Usually it's somewhere between 25 and 35, depending on what the top line revenue breakdown is. But then I've got a healthy bottom line if we're all in the benchmark. So that's kind of how we look at the income statement. If there are um, percentages that look out of whack, not traditional to what we, that's when we start to do a deeper dive and look into that analysis. So from an operations standpoint, that tells me all of those things. Are we a healthy operating company? On the balance sheet, that tells me whether we're a financially well-positioned company or not. So the two big ones that I always start with there is the current ratio, and that's your current assets divided by your current liabilities. So assuming that all of those chart of accounts are set up the way they should be, um, the benchmark that we look at is a two-to-one ratio. So if you think of it as a, a liquidity measure, if I had to get money from everybody who owed me money right now, today and combine that with what I've got in the bank account. And then I paid everybody off immediately that I owed money to, I should have twice as much money left over when that transaction is done. The other balance sheet ratio I look at is the debt to equity ratio. 
Uh, and, and that tells me, you know, how much, how much is still in the business? Um, am I upside down? Um, you know, do I owe more than what I have accumulated equity in the business? Um, if, if that's the case, then I go digging deeper. Uh, but ideally, most folks look at a one-to-one -one or less ratio there. You want to have less liabilities or debt than you have equity in the business. So that's kind of my highlight reel. And JT, I'm sure you've got your own on that one as well. Oh, I'll just echo all that. It's down in the weeds with all the details. I love that, <laughs> Tim. So, no, it's perfect. And when I start looking at KPIs, I, I'm looking at gross margins and net profits and adjusted EBITDA margins. And and what I'm looking at is trends year over year. You know, I want to know why cost of goods went up three or four percent one year and dropped the following year. And and I, I'm trying to figure out what normal is for that business because we've got to tell that story to potential buyers. And the long and short of it for my seat is that every every percentage point matters. You know, people just don't think about one or two percent here and there, but you're doing a twenty million dollar company and a couple of percentage points. You know, all of a sudden there's uh, two hundred or four hundred thousand dollars on the bottom line that that should have been there and isn't because something went up a couple of percentage points or down a couple of percentage points. So it matters. There's real dollars attached to every percentage point. And so when when uh, I know Tim loves these percentages, when when he starts talking about that in your company it's worthy of paying attention to understand exactly what's happening in your business. Your, your bottom line will thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's do story time. It's my favorite part. We're here. Um, JT, we'll start with you. Um, highlights and or low lights of financial cleanliness you, you've seen. Um, I would actually really love an example of a highlight where you've had a company come in and you're like, they nailed it. We looked at their books. Their immediate evaluation was really good. They were rock solid yeah. on XYZ, like a really solid example. The uh, I sold one in the Bay Area. I worked with them and it was a, a sort of a grand slam on many, many levels. It, uh, there was uh, another broker that put this company at a much reduced price. I had a little higher. We sold for even twice that because the growth was so fast. And one of the things I loved about this company, and they were Violin clients, and I'm sure Violin had something to do with this, is all of their software was talking to each other. And it was so impressive. It was the cleanest company. And I told the owner this, I told her that this was the cleanest company I've ever looked at in 15 years in the space. Somebody out in the field would click a button wow. and instantly it would ripple through the company. It was magical. It just doesn't happen like that in the space. And so, and, and, I mean, it happened the way it was supposed to, Tim, put it that way. It was That's really, good. really <laughs> wonderful. And when I first brought this company to market, um, one of the industry strategics, you know, you're thinking first on site and ATI and BMS, these companies, um, they looked at this company and they instantly called me back and said, JT, they're too cool for us. We wouldn't know what to do with them. <laughs> and I said, what does that mean? And they wow. said, we just, we can't even wrap our head around that, te that technology. So here we've got a company that is so clean on every level with software and the numbers and the KPIs and the career paths and the, the measurement statistics and right down to the fact that a tech could walk in the front door and see their career path to being a project manager. And if you asked her how many techs have gone through that process and three years later, they, they go from making $18 an hour to 150 grand a year, she can rattle off exactly who's been through that. So clean, top to bottom. And then you've got a, a buyer that says, I wouldn't know what to do with them. That, that's a problem. And so the, the cleaner, the better. You, you make a few intentional choices, it, it will come back to you in spades. Well, that's like a proud papa. That's and, and tremendous. <laughs> crying baby in the same story. I love it. Yeah, it, it's, it was a great, uh, a great experience. And it, uh, owners of this business should, should get into the software consulting business because they, and yeah, I'm sure that stemmed from Violin, but really a great uh, system from top to bottom. That's amazing. Well, Tim, you get to follow up. Can you top that story? Uh, you're going to be on the flip side. I, I, no, you can go the able, other way. I'm you're glad just... we were able to participate in that one. No, I mean, yeah. I think I finished the story that I started the, the podcast with, which was that uh, intermingling of personal funds, you know, mm -hmm. from from uh, a company standpoint. And, um, you know, we had we had been asked to work on a, on a turnaround engagement, which 
they're not my favorite to do quite honestly um but it can be very rewarding on the back side but you know unfortunately in this situation uh the owner who who had owned the business for a very long time had intermingled the personal funds with the business funds to the degree that his lifestyle was so mm. great that it, it placed a very large financial burden on the business and and i mean all, almost all of the personal expenses, utility bills, everything was run through the business uh, in lieu of compensation. So where they were at with the business required a downsize as the best strategy to get it back on track again. Well, unfortunately, we couldn't shrink the expenses that fast enough. Uh, and I think the end was inevitable, um, you know, from, from the very start, which is unfortunate um, because had those expenses and that income been separated the way it really should have been from a fiscal responsibility standpoint, there may have been uh, a way of overcoming that deficit and, and getting the business back on track again. So, you know, it's it's sad uh, to see a storied company, especially the way they were, um, go that direction. Uh, fortunately, you know, a, a buyer did come to the table, JT, um, and and said, you know what, I'll I'll help you out here. I'll acquire the debt. And in exchange for um, which was what was essentially a, a, a value less business at that point, mm -hmm. but at least saved the owner from bankruptcy, saved a lot of uh, face with the customers and all that other good stuff. So I guess there was a silver lining in the end of that story. Mm -hmm. There was a silver lining. JT, anything you want to add to that? And I want you to, before we wrap this one up, talk a little bit more about ad backs. I've done a lot of podcasts on M&A, and this is the first time I've ever heard that term. Um, so I'm guessing that the industry knows, and maybe I just have like totally missed it. But talk a little bit more about ad backs and what some of the most common ones are that you see where something's running through a business and it's like, nope, that's going right back the other way. We could do a whole nother episode on ad backs because it's so vast. I think I mentioned earlier, uh, and everyone should be familiar with that. People will, will mix up the term recast earnings or recast adjustments, but they're ad backs. And we're adding expenses, things that were expensed that we can add back to the bottom line to show benefit to a buyer. So four buckets, the EBITDA business, personal and normalizations. EBITDA is self-explanatory. It's the interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. The only extra one to that is if you've got some cash sitting around and there's interest earned, that gets deducted. So that takes care of our uh, EBITDA bucket. The business bucket is interesting and it's evolved over the last couple of years. This started off as PPP loans and grants that, that happened starting in 2020, rolled over into 2021. It's charitable donations, those sorts of things. Industry consultants, you know, if you're a, a company out there who's paying, let's say, Violin good money to consult to them every year and, and find it rewarding, you've got a lot of clients that are, you know, decade or more clients, and it's wonderful. The average buyer is not going to pay a consultant, so we get to add those fees back. There's four or five things that typically show up in a business bucket, and we can add it back. Personal buckets are vehicle payments, vehicle insurance, meals and entertainment, uh, travel, you know, you go down to Florida for a three-day Violin Summit and you stay a week and the business picks up the whole thing. Well, it wasn't all a business expense, okay? So we all do that. There's business owners in general have a few perks, you know, that get run through the business. It can be uh, uh, adjustments for spouses. Some business owners, they have spouses that work in the business and they're they're fairly compensated. Let's say they're an office administrator and they're making $80,000 a year, let's say. And what's, what's unique about that situation is you can have a spouse that's there 100 hours a week and they don't make anything because they're just relying on the other spouse's income. You can have a spouse that hasn't stepped foot in the business for 10 years, yet they're still making 100 grand a year. They're an employee. They just happen to not show up. All of that's perfectly legal, okay? So there's, there's adjustments that we make to salaries. I've had two clients over the last couple of years that pay their kids a thousand bucks a week to come in and take out the trash on Saturday mornings. And that's their college fund. There's, there's adjustments that need to be made when it comes to you know family relationships. And then the last bucket are normalizations. And this is typically an owner salary adjustment, rent adjustments. You know, let's say someone owns the building and the business is just picking up the mortgage payment on the, the piece of property. But really, it's it's not, you know, it's called a $4,000 a month payment. Really, rent would be $5,500 a month or $6,000 a month. 
but we adjust that so it looks the way it needs to, you know, for a buyer. So by the time we shake it all out, we're trying to give a buyer a very accurate picture of what their bottom line is going to look like with the adjustments considered. Does that help out on the adjustment comments? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tim, is there anything you want to add to that one? No, it was spot on in textbook. I think the only thing that I might be able to add any value to is, is the understanding that while much of that is done in, a, in an attempt to minimize tax liability as being seen as you know something you're not supposed to do, mm -hmm. when we take a look at the valuation of a business, identifying those items are important because it adds value mm -hmm. to the valuation. So... Mm -hmm. Don't be embarrassed if, if JT does an evaluation for you and you say, I'm, I'm running this expense through the business because Tim said it was bad on that podcast I listened to. No, he needs to know. <laughs> <laughs> he needs to know that you're paying your kid a thousand bucks a week to take out the garbage. Yeah. Because that, that adds to the value of the business at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I ask a lot of questions as you do, Tim. It's I've, I've got dozens and dozens of questions teed up because the owner sometimes can't remember all the things they run through the business right down to, you know, the laptop that they bought their son for Christmas. They put it on a business card because they could, and that laptop will never see a day of work in his life, you know, in the office. So things like that, that, that I just team up for and try to jog their memory. So we, we typically recover uh, most all the expenses. It's rare that someone comes back after the fact and says, Oh, I forgot to add this back. It happens occasionally, but it, we're pretty accurate. Yeah. Bottom line is don't don't try to pass off Harley and Davidson as your accounting firm. There you go. That's right. <laughs> that's a that's yeah, a Chuck perfect. joke too, Michelle. By the way, yeah, it's a Chuck <laughs> joke. Okay, Chuck jokes should come with Chuck bucks. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else that either of you want to add before we wrap this one up? Good stuff. Oh, good I stuff. think we're good. Thank you, Michelle. Yes. So for anybody who's listening, you can catch up on the other episodes in this series by going to CNR's website under videos, or you can go to your favorite podcast platform and type in Chasing the Vision, or you can go to YouTube. You can find them anywhere. They're all over social media and everywhere. You can't miss them. Um, there's several more episodes to come, so stay tuned. Tim and JT, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, JT. Oh.